Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to have a lot of fun today. Um, I really enjoy this year in review webinar. Uh, I spoke really quickly and I was getting super excited and waving my hands all around in the 12 o'clock session. We had a lot of good questions. I'm going to try to speak a little more slowly and less excitedly in this three o'clock session, but I hope uh, we still get a lot of great questions. All right, so let's begin. Uh, let's talk about what we're going to discuss today in this year and year in review uh, webinar. We're going to look back at 2019 in the New York workers' compensation world, and we're going to talk about everything that's new and different. Um, of course, I'm going to talk about a little bit of my firm, things that changed here, uh, different ways we're practically handling cases. Uh, I'm going to talk about filing statistics and trends, things we're seeing, things that are affecting uh, our employers and clients. I'm going to talk about case law developments, and we're going to go through uh, eight or nine or maybe 10 uh, cases that I thought were interesting out of the 70 or 80 that we've put on the website over the last year. I'm going to talk about pending rule changes, and in particular, the IME changes that we're anticipating and looking at. And I'm going to try to give you as much practical advice and useful takeaways as I can. I want this to be as useful and as fun as we possibly can make it. Now, this is completely live. Uh, please ask me questions. There's a box you can type in. Um, I can see the questions pop up. I will answer questions at the end, and I will not embarrass you. I will only say your first name, and I will answer the question the best I can. If I can't answer your question or I just don't know the answer, uh, that's okay. I'll call you afterwards. Uh, try to stump me. I dare you. Uh, all right. Let's talk a little bit about our handbook. So hopefully by now, if you're out there, uh, you've already received a copy of our New York Workers' Compensation Handbook, or you've downloaded it directly from our website. We encourage you to do that. Uh, the 2020 handbook this year, I'm going to hold it up uh, a lot thicker than last year. We've got a lot of new case law in here. Uh, we got rid of a lot of old stuff that didn't make any more sense. We're talking about the new medical fee schedule. We're talking about a lot of the new things. Now, most of my clients do not read this entire book. They just go to the back where we've got the cheat sheets and they use the cheat sheets. And it's okay if you do that. I'm not judging you. Uh, we also have a New Jersey handbook, which is completely new this year. Our New Jersey handbook was uh, uh, more in depth. We've added a lot more about medical provider claims, and we didn't actually add some of the stuff that I talked about at the bench bar convention in New Jersey in December when I presented to all the judges and attorneys in the workers' compensation uh, division. Uh, new this year is our construction handbook, and this is written by my partner. You can see her picture there on the back. Uh, this is uh, Tashia Razul, who heads our construction defense litigation team here. And this book is intended for those of us who are defending wrap-up policies, large construction projects in New York, where there is going to be an interaction and a challenge in coordinating the general liability attorneys uh, with the workers' compensation attorneys. And this book covers step-by-step -step exactly how to do that, how to maintain privileges, what to think about the disclosure rules in both jurisdictions, and then provides sort of a practical play-by-play -play for achieving what your really your goal is in those wrap-ups which is a global settlement that resolves both matters at once. And the last thing I'm gonna point people to, uh, which is not new this year, but I'm gonna keep referring to it throughout this webinar, is our Third Fridays podcast. And that's led by my partner, Christian Cisan. And that is sort of a compliment to the webinar series that uh, we present every month. He really talks about uh, second level or higher order uh, implications and applications of the changes in the workers' compensation law and really gives some like in-depth, uh, interesting ideas and twists on defending workers' compensation claims in New York. So uh, I strongly recommend uh, re uh, that podcast. Now, I've placed a link in the chat uh, of this uh, uh, meeting, so you can go into that link and you can download directly all of these books and handbooks, and uh, also you can subscribe over iTunes to Christian's uh, podcast, which again is an awesome resource. Uh, we have a new monthly schedule of webinars, so uh, the first Monday of the month is our construction team's litigation webinar. Uh, second Monday of the month is our risk transfer team. That's going to be led by Chris Major. Uh, informally, we're calling that Major Mondays, and that's a lot of fun. He talks about risk transfer, reimbursement, subrogation. Uh, he'll talk about the ins and outs of loss transfer, all of that stuff. On um, the third Monday of the month, I present, in general, it's usually me, uh, the New York Workers' Compensation webinar. Uh, and on the fourth Monday of the month, my partner, Joe Jones, or myself, will provide the, an overview of New Jersey workers' compensation topics. So please join us for all of those. And I placed a registration link in the chat function of this meeting. All right, let's jump into some fun cases. Now, uh, disclaimer, uh, first of all, 
uh, I didn't pick maybe uh, the most common cases uh, or the most applicable cases. I picked the cases I thought were the most interesting or had a weird view of the law uh, or were good for the defense and are kind of exciting to us from a defense perspective. So uh, please understand that I didn't try to pick a, a case in every category that we talk about and in our handbooks. I just tried to pick ones that I was interested in or I thought were fun or provided an interesting glimpse at the behind the scenes. So let's jump into them. The first case I want to talk about is Angora versus Wegmans Food. Now this case was decided in April 25 of 2019. So it's relatively recently. And here we have our poor warehouse worker who injures his arm and shoulder while working uh, in the warehouse. This is an admitted accepted claim. This claim was not disputed. Medical treatment was provided. Lost time was compensated. Uh, he was out of work for about a year. I think it was a little over a year, 13 months. Uh, it turns out while he's out of work, uh, he's also opening a bar. Uh, and the Wegmans put him under surveillance and they caught him not only opening and closing the bar and doing normal things uh, like taking out the garbage, which you would expect, but also doing things like uh, taking people's orders, answering the phone in every way, uh, fully handling uh, the day-to-day -day of running a bar. Uh, good for him. Uh, but uh, he did not disclose this to his treating physician who continued to write him out of work notes. Uh, and again, he was out of the employment for 13 months. Turns out, though, he was working in his own bar. Uh, the trial judge found that this was a fraud. And, you know, so many of these get turned over at the appellate division level. I'm bringing this case out because the appellate division came forward and said, quote, because he failed to disclose, close quote, uh, his workability and what he was actually doing in his real life to his treating physician, uh, that itself constituted the fraud. So, in other words, even though uh, no one asks him in court, are you working or not working? The fact that he is working and he's not telling his treating physician, that's enough to find a fraud in this case. So I thought that was an interesting case and very useful. Uh, so many times I hear uh, as a defense to fraud is, well, nobody asked me or you didn't know, the judge never asked me under oath. Well, uh, this case stands for the proposition that not telling your own treating physician uh, is enough to establish that fraud. So great case for the defense. All right, next case, uh, and you know, here's one of these cases where I thought in a million years this will never happen, uh, but it happens. This case is called Kennedy versus Star Construction, and this case examines the implications of Section 21 in a workers' compensation case. Now, this case, uh, which is decided on June 20th, 2019, examines one of the presumptions. So, an employee who's injured at work in New York is afforded certain presumptions, and some of them are really basic, like if the employee, if it happened at work, it's likely compensable, right? Uh, if it's unwitnessed, it's likely compensable. Uh, but there's a fifth presumption in there, which is that uh, in, if the uh, intoxication is not a defense to a worker's compensation case, unless intoxication is the sole cause of the injury. Now, in my lifetime, I've defended many, many, many intoxication cases. And what the, really happens in those litigations is uh, the claimant is looking for any other contributing factor that caused the injury to say, yeah, I was drunk, but the workplace also was dark, and that's why I tripped and fell and hit my head. Or, yeah, I was stoned out of my mind, but the ladder I was given was slippery, and the ladder plus me being stoned out of my mind is why I got injured. The intoxication was not the sole cause of my injury, and I've heard it so many times. And we almost sometimes think of an intoxication defense as like a unicorn. Uh, it's almost one of those things where everybody knows what a unicorn looks like, but no one's ever seen a unicorn. Uh, well, here's a case, uh, Kennedy versus Dara Construction, that was decided in June, in which the claimant had a head-on car accident. Now, uh, the facts are uh, that he uh, went home for lunch, and he was in the company vehicle, so he was driving the, the work truck. Uh, which he drove as part of his normal job. He went home for lunch. His wife admits uh, he did have uh, something to drink at once. She said he just had a sip of vodka, but not enough to get him drunk. And she presented in court uh, uh, to testify to this. And of course, it's very sympathetic because he has four children, uh, dependent children as well. Um, however, um, the facts of the accident were that he's just driving back to the workplace. Uh, again, he's in a work truck. He for no reason at all that no one can tell, he just swerves across the yellow line, strikes another vehicle head on accident. He never recovers from his injuries. He ultimately dies. So this is a dependency case. Um, now, the workers' compensation law judge said that this was not compensable because he was clearly intoxicated. 
post-mortem uh, blood tests show that not only did he have extremely high levels of ethanol or alcohol in his blood, but he also had benzodiazepines and cocaine in his system. So it seems that he went home that day and had more than just a sip of vodka to be that drunk and also to have illegal drugs in his system. Now, I'm imagining that the claimant is arguing, but I was in a work truck. So it wasn't just the intoxication that killed me, it's the fact that I'm driving this big truck or whatever. Uh, the, both the trial court and the appellate division would not stand for it and said, nope, there doesn't seem to be any other contributing factor than his drunkenness. There's no reason he swerved into oncoming traffic and drove right into traffic except for the intoxication. And because of that reason, we are finding this not compensable. So a very rare case of finding a injury not compensable as a result of intoxication. So that's very good and strong, interesting for the defense. The next case, I think, illustrates uh, a common problem that we see. I always tell my clients, look, we should red flag cases where the employer is the claimant. And what I mean by that is a small company where the owner of the company becomes a claimant. Real trouble investigating, real chances for a conflict of interest. Now, in this case, Horvath versus Mega Forklift, uh, which was reported on October 3, 2019, in this appellate division case, the claimant was involved in a motor vehicle accident. The claimant also happened to be the owner of the company. And the claimant didn't immediately report this to the workers' compensation carrier. The accident occurred on March 13, 2015. He actually went out and got medical care and including a shoulder surgery and didn't report it to the carrier until March of 2017, so almost exactly two years later, uh, just, just shy of that two-year statute of limitations. The carrier argued to the trial court that this is not fair, that failing to report your injuries to the carrier prejudiced the carrier. The appellate division uh, agreed with the trial court, affirmed the trial court's finding that he had failed to provide proper notice to the carrier. Now, his arguments are, I have to provide notice to my employer. By the way, I am the employer, so who cares? Uh, but the appellate division came back and agreed with the trial court and said, no, 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 no. Uh, you have done something uh, that has put your carrier in a worse position. They do not have the opportunity to investigate this claim. They don't have the opportunity to challenge medical care because you went out and got the medical care on your own and you didn't get anybody's permission for it or a check in and didn't follow medical treatment guidelines, et cetera. And because you've, uh, you've really prejudiced the employer, uh, the notice defense works. So this is an interesting case where that notice defense actually was useful and it also illustrates the challenge we have when the employer and the claimant are the same person. Be very careful of those. I consider those typically red flaggers. Uh, okay, next, weird case. This is one that just like made me go, huh? Uh, this is strange. So Colbert versus Niagara City. This is a case that I think um, illustrates the lengths the board will go to to find that someone has wages so that they can award them money. Uh, this case, which was decided on May 16, 2019 by the appellate division, is be, involved a work fair recipient. New York really doesn't have this anymore, but they used to have something called work fair or uh, workplace experience program. And the idea was that people who are on welfare for long periods of time, who were not disabled, who were not elderly, and who are not children should be doing some kind of work or at least getting some kind of work experience so they could reattach to the workforce at some point. And so the state kind of made up jobs for them to do. Uh, this gentleman got injured while doing one of his state made up jobs. Interestingly, uh, he claims that uh, even though he wasn't getting paid for the work, he, his getting welfare was dependent on him reporting for this workfare position. Uh, the judge went for it, and the judge uh, made an award of permanent partial disability, used the wages from the workfare job to, as a, or the payment that he got from the state uh, for his living expenses, called that wages, and Bob's your uncle. But the interesting thing was there was no money moving because the claimant was still on welfare. So there was really no, there was an award made, but there was no money moving under the award. Um, however, he, he then uh, goes and gets a very uh, small job such that he no longer qualified for welfare, or perhaps they changed the rules and he was no longer qualifying for welfare. Um, and when he moves off of welfare, now he says, okay, pay me my indemnity benefits uh, because uh, I'm entitled to them. And that should be calculated on the missed welfare benefits that I'm get, getting anymore. Now, the trial court said no, but the appellate division said yes. Uh, they said, yep, your wages are your welfare payments. We're going to use that to calculate. And yes, you are owed money. And I guess the idea here would be uh, because he sustained an injury at work, even though the work was mandated by statute that prevented him from further gainful employment, 
that's why he would be due indemnity benefits. So here's a case in which someone's welfare benefits were used to calculate uh, their average weekly wage for the purpose of providing them with an indemnity benefit. All I can say, people, is only in New York. Only in New York does this stuff happen. All right, next. Uh, here's an interesting fraud case uh, and uh, makes you kind of go, what is happening in this state? Stone versus Salisbury Federal Signal. This is a decision coming out May 30th, 2019. Uh, so this is an oldie, but a goodie. So in 2002, Stone uh, claimant was classified as having a permanent partial disability. Uh, and he re received his permanent partial disability award. Remember back then, these awards were uncapped. So they were gonna run for the rest of his life. However, uh, he wasn't so happy with just uh, obtaining or getting his permanent partial disability award. He decided to become a meth lab and he uh, got convicted and ultimately incarcerated in 2016 uh, for uh, being basically the Walter White of Breaking Bad. He was a, a meth cooker and meth distributor. Uh, so he goes to jail in 2016. Now, under the workers' compensation law in New York, uh, if the you know, claimant is getting paid a wage replacement benefit or a permanent partial disability award, and they become incarcerated, convicted and incarcerated, I should say, convicted and incarcerated, the benefit is suspended until they come out of jail. So that's what happened. In 2016, his award was suspended. Now he gets out of jail, and the Workers' Compensation Board directed that his benefit, his Workers' Compensation Award, be reinstated. He served his time. Now let's pay him. Uh, and the carrier comes forward and very astutely says, wait, what? Uh, the entire time he was receiving his permanent partial disability award from 2002 until 2016, apparently he's a meth dealer. Uh, he had another form of employment, which he wasn't reporting to us. That's a fraud, judge. And in a bizarre uh, case uh, where the uh, carrier is alleging like he's obviously involved in cr criminal enterprise, he's obviously doing this for money, He's got a meth lab. He was convicted uh, for having possession of the equipment and precursors and chemicals and solvents that are used to create methamphetamine. Uh, the trial court says uh, he is not entitled to workers' compensation. The appellate division says, yes, he is. The appellate division comes forward and says, well, look, uh, you don't know how much money he was earning in, from that 14-year period when you were paying him and he was cooking meth. And he was only convicted for possession of all of the equipment and chemicals and precursors uh, to create meth. So we don't know if he was actually doing it for profit or not. Therefore, you can't call him a fraud. You don't know how much money he earned from the meth enterprise. What? Uh, this is New York, and this is the kind of crazy stuff that happens. Um, the board's uh, finding that the uh, conviction alone is insufficient to establish work activity is relied upon by the appellate division, and they say this guy who's a, a meth dealer, a meth maker, and served time in jail, well, we don't think he did that for money. So obviously, uh, you know, check your logic at the door when you come at cases like this. All right, next. Uh, here's an interesting case on the issue of causal relationship, and particularly in the repetitive orthopedic context. Um, these are a frequent case. You don't see a lot of these, but when you do, it's usually an end of career type of uh, claim. Usually it's a throw in claim. You know, it's, hey, I'm, I'm leaving. Uh, let's see if I can get a little money. So Barker worked for the New York City Department, uh, uh, the police department, in the evidence lot. Uh, this is a case that was reported on October 3, 2019. And uh, the claimant uh, worked there as property control specialist for 29 years. So this is the person who's tagging and bagging uh, evidence and keeping evidence in an evidence locker. Uh, they allege that repetitive trauma to their shoulders and arms rendered them disabled. Now, interestingly, uh, they went into detail explaining, well, I'm hand scanning bags. I am uh, picking up and closing envelopes. I'm moving small boxes around, sometimes with assistance all uh, evidence that's being turned in. Not one thing, uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of cumulative activity allegedly causing an osteo, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a orthopedic injury. Now, uh, the Workers' Compensation Board and the Appellate Division said, you know, there's nothing here in your testimony 
that shows anything unique about your day-to-day -day that would cause this type of repetitive injury that you're claiming. And in fact, the fact is, you're doing lots of different types of things all day long. You're bagging evidence of all different sizes. Some days you're moving things with help, some days without. And because your work duties are still varied and because there's nothing really distinctive or peculiar to this employment uh, that would uh, lend itself to a very specific type of repetitive use injury, we're not going to find that you have any type of cumulative trauma. Your case is denied and dismissed. All right, that's pretty interesting. That could be useful in some of our cases where uh, the employee is not doing the exact same job over and over and over and over again. Maybe he has uh, a number of different activities and then cumulatively at the end of their 29 years, now they're blaming uh, essentially what's the degenerative effects of aging on something to do with the employment. So that could be useful for us as well. All right. Uh, Let's take a look at another case. This is one we we have uh, discussed in our webinars a few times this year. And I really only stuck this in here because A, it's a good reminder, and also B, because the um, leave to appeal uh, to the Court of Appeals was just recently denied in 2019. So technically this counts as a 2019 case. So Tayer versus Yoda. Um, the leave was just denied, so I think it is useful. Uh, this case stands for the proposition that you can't get a SLU, a scheduled loss of use, and a loss of wage earning capacity award at the same time from the same case. You've got to pick and choose. Uh, this case is not good for claimants. It is good for the defense in general, because if the claimant's working, uh, they can get a SLU, go back to work, but they can't get a SLU and a PPD and then choose and pick and choose when they're going to leave the employment. And if there's a potential for a PPD, they shouldn't be getting a SLU. So this is a good case for the defense, and we've been relying on it, and we've talked about it a lot. Just this year, uh, my partner, Christian Cisong, uh, along with some people on his team, did podcasts on just this topic of how this case applies, what this case means, and I would recommend uh, listening to those podcasts because they really went into in-depth uh, how this case can be applied, how this case can be weaponized, what, how this case is useful for us. So uh, up on the screen, you have a link to the um, Third Fridays. I've also put it in the chat. And I would look at the July and November podcast because he did talk about it twice because it's an interesting case. All right, uh, next, um, Carta Felsa versus Zurich. Uh, this case touches on two uh, interlocking kind of ideas. One's causal relationship and one's cardiac claims. What kind of proofs are necessary for the claimant to win in a cardiac claim? And what kind of proofs on causal relationship does a judge of compensation have to consider uh, or should they consider? So this case is interesting because I've seen a lot of cases like this, and I thought this outcome was very good for the employer and uh, really could be very illustrative, particularly for uh, like a new attorney, a new defense counsel. Uh, so this case is uh, decided on December 26, 2019. And in this case, the claimant had a heart attack. He had a myocardial infarction. Uh, you know, uh, and it apparently was a real infarction, not just angina or chest pain or coronary artery disease. He had myocardial infarction. He also comes into court and he's got the uh, uh, report of his doctor. His doctor was named Henry Cabin, uh, who says, uh, yep, uh, PFME was found by the judge. That's prima facie medical evidence. And interestingly, the judge of compensation precluded or stripped uh, the IME report of the employer. And I'm not, it's not, clear to me why that was happened, but let me be frank with you, that happens a lot in New York Workers' Compensation Court, and we'll talk a little bit about the IME Advisory Committee in a minute. But uh, the, the, the defense independent medical examination was precluded, which is usually a bad sign. This means you're left with just the treating doctor's opinion, but defense counsel in this case cross-examined the treating doctor, Dr. Henry Cabin. Uh, Henry Cabin uh, under oath testifies that work stress, quote, possibly contributed to the condition, as well as, of course, the claimant's other comorbid or co-extant conditions. All right, so this is interesting. Um, they were able to uh, get the treating doctor to admit, hey, he had a myocardial infarction and maybe his work stress, maybe, or possibly contributed. Uh, and that's really not the standard. Uh, the judge of compensation standard has got to be, there has to be reasonable and objective evidence of some causal relationship uh, between the workplace and the resultant injury, in this case, myocardial infarction. And in fact, in this case, there was nothing extraordinary or peculiar or anything that really the judge of compensation could point to, and they just weren't provided with anything interesting. The appellate division said that uh, the testimony of the treating physician, that the claimant was, quote, under tremendous amount of work stress, close quote, by itself is not enough to establish the case. The case should not be established 
uh, because the claimant could not show anything extraordinary or peculiar. So that's a really interesting outcome and a really good outcome for the defense. We should be thinking to ourselves, when we defend cardiac claims, the claimant has uh, a burden of proof on them, and it's not just any doctor coming in and saying, well, maybe it's work-related. There really has to be a lot more than that. So let's be uh, you know, mindful of that looking toward it. All right, uh, next case, attachment case. Uh, attachment, uh, well, it could be a super powerful defense when it's used correctly. Uh, in New York, a workers' compensation claimant has to remain attached to the workforce in order to be entitled to benefits. Uh, uh, sorry, temporary total disability benefits or temporary partial disability benefits. They have to be looking for work within their uh, restrictions. Now, Figueroa worked for Con Ed. Uh, it seems pretty clear to me. Uh, this is a retirement case, but that's just my interpretation. This case was decided on January 31, 2019. Um, they, they filed a workers' compensation claim against Consolidated Edison, uh, who is probably a frequent target of these, as most uh, large employers and or state or public entities are, and then retired the following month. So it's, uh, thanks for employing me all these years, been wonderful, and here's my out-the-door workers' compensation claim. Uh, now, unfortunately, Con Ed lost, and she did receive a permanent partial disability award, an LWEC award, for 33.3% for bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay, it happened. Uh, at least it's a capped award. Uh, but they then said, wait a second, she has to show that she's attached to the workforce, because remember, Judge, she retired the following month. She voluntarily retired. Uh, so she does what uh, claimant does next is they go to One Stop, Workforce One or One Stop, uh, to go register their resume and maybe uh, look at some job postings on the board. Uh, my experience, and tell me if I'm wrong, I never seen anybody ever get a job after going to One Stop, but okay. Uh, she actually did apply for numerous positions and could argue in court that she had applied for jobs. However, she said that all the jobs were, quote, filled, close quote, and that's why she couldn't get a job. Pay me my money, judge. The judge of compensation case uh, ultimately uh, found attachment and said, well, she did what she was supposed to do. She went to Workforce One, she registered a resume, and she applied for jobs. Unfortunately, they were all filled, so now you have to pay her her permanent partial disability award. Uh, Con Ed appealed, and this is a great appeal because it illustrates the difference between uh, just kind of letting things go in by the numbers and maybe taking a closer look at it. In this appeal, they argued, hey, if you're applying for jobs and you're not getting the jobs because they're all filled, that doesn't count because you're not, not getting the jobs because of your disability or there's nothing restricting you from getting the jobs. It's that they're just filled jobs. Uh, it's the same as if the claimant goes for a job and knocks on the door and they say, oh, I'm sorry, not hiring. Well, that's not really looking for a job if you're only looking at places that are not hiring. You've got to actually try to get an actual job that's actually not filled. Uh, so that's an interesting thought uh, that she didn't uh, do that. And the board found that her temporary disability uh, was not a factor in her inability to find employment. Her temporary disability was not the reason she couldn't find unemployment is that she was looking for jobs that had already been filled. So uh, this is a situation where the claimant maybe thought they were being uh, cute and clever uh, and it didn't work. So good job. All right, uh, let's take a look ahead at what's new and what's coming up and the kind of things that we're going to be looking at in 2020 and stuff you can use and then we'll get to questions. So if you haven't typed your question in yet, now is the perfect time. All right, first, uh, this year I'm looking forward to getting some case law on the temporary disability credit against permanency. Uh, the April 2017 changes to the statute rolled into effect on October 9, 2019. And this means that for cases where the claimant's been out of work for more than 130 weeks, a credit begins to accrue in those cases if the date of loss is after April 10, 2017, and they continue on temporary disability after October 9, 2019, because 130 weeks have elapsed. Now, unfortunately, we just haven't seen any real new case law come out on this yet because the cases are all just too new and fresh and because the law just changed and the credit is just starting to accrue. But I think in 2020, we are going to get some case law on this and it's going to be very useful. Uh, if anybody has a case on temp credit that they'd like to talk about with me, I'm very happy to listen and provide advice uh, because I really want the appellate division decision that analyzes how the temp credit works uh, to be favorable to employers. All right, next. Uh, this year, we're going to have an IME rules change. Uh, the Independent Medical Examination Advisory Committee submitted their final report in December 2019. Frankly, 
uh, they just punted or kicked the ball down the road on a lot of things that they were asked to look at, things like panels, things like judge assignments, uh, things like the frequency of IMEs that are conducted by one specific person. Uh, they really didn't reach conclusions on a lot of things, and in fact, their IME advisory committee report just says, uh, for a lot of issues in contention, things like IME advisory committee could not reach a consensus. The things they could reach a consensus on are a reduction in overall paperwork and particularly redundant paperwork that's unnecessary and also a change uh, to the same day same manner of service rule currently all ime reports need to be served within 10 days of the report and served on all parties the same day and the same way so if you fax to one party you got to fax to them all so that everybody gets the report at the same time this is incredibly difficult to do and leads to many of the reports getting precluded for purely technical dumb reasons that have nothing to do with the quality of the report. So that would be something that would be very useful for all employers if that uh, rule ultimately does get changed. So we're gonna be watching that very closely and I will certainly provide uh, notice of that if that happens. Uh, the impact of the drug formulary, which went into effect on December 5, 2019, is already starting to have an impact in cases. Uh, it has uh, given us some more tools to reduce unnecessary and money-wasting medications, particularly non-generics and particularly compounds. So that's very useful for us. We're also seeing more and more doctors enrolling and using the medical portal, which is also very good. Uh, so the medical portal is expanding and it seems to be uh, useful so far. Um, next, at Lois, uh, we have two new teams that recently formed here. Uh, with industry focus. The first one is the construction defense litigation team. Uh, all they do is defend OSIPs and large projects. That's literally all they do. They've written the book on it. My partner, Tashia Rizul, heads that team. If you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, the next team that we've developed here is, uh, oh, uh, is uh, sorry, uh, our reimbursement team, uh, where we're doing nothing but risk transfer, and reimbursement and loss transfer. Uh, and that's uh, led by Chris Major. And if anyone has any questions about that, please let me know. Uh, next, I am doing a virtual hearings pilot for one of my clients, and our goal is to see uh, the impact of virtual hearings on cost and litigation expense, but also on case phasing and time to close. Uh, metrics are a huge part of what we do here. Uh, and anybody who's interested in that pilot project or any of the internal external metrics that we're using and sharing with our clients, I'm very happy to talk about that with you. Uh, last thing I want to mention is we do have this construction handbook, which I think I've talked about a couple times. All right, uh, I've talked enough. I've been at this for about 30 minutes. I'm hoping there are some great questions in the channel. I'm going to go open that up now. If you haven't typed your question in yet, now is the time to do it. All right, this can't possibly be right. It's saying no questions. Hold on, I'm going to close that out and reopen it. Come on, I expected more out of you, 3 o'clock session. Nothing, nothing. All right. Either I did a great job or I went so fast and you didn't even have time to type. I don't know. Um, all right, uh, let me open it up one more time and make sure this isn't like a computer glitch. Uh, all right, Steve, thank you. You got a question. Uh, regarding temp credits and case law on reclassification, you have, and then you give me a site of a case and you say for claims that fall within this, can we request reimbursement? No, so okay. So that's an interesting question. Does the temp credit go backwards? No, it only applies to cases with a date of loss after April 10, 2017 and going forward. And I can tell Steve just from the board case number, the index number, which starts with two zeros, that you've got an old dog case. It's really easy to tell us it doesn't start with G number, it's not gonna uh, uh, likely fall under that. So no, it doesn't go back in time. The data loss has to be after April 10, 2017. Sorry to break your heart. Michelle asked a question. Greg, are the new medical, uh, sorry, prescription guidelines rocket science or is it just me? Okay, uh, no, uh, they're not that bad actually compared to the medical treatment guidelines. Remember, uh, before we had the drug formulary, you'd have to kind of go through all the medical treatment guidelines page by page and there was you know six of them and each one of them is 80 pages long and see if the medical treatment or if the, or if the medication was specifically authorized and where and how. Uh, the new formulary, it's only 12 pages long, the whole thing. It does list out all the medications um, pretty clearly and it has some very big bright line rules which I think are very useful. In particular, the if there is a generic, have to use the generic and no compounds, so no unique uh, formulations. And if something is a generic plus a non-generic, 
and that's what makes it uh, necessary. And I'm thinking of things like duexis or other things which involve, uh, like for example, anti-inflammatories that also uh, combine antacids together and somehow that's got to be one big specialty medication. It knocks all that stuff out. So it's really useful from sort of a big picture point of view. Um, okay. Uh, Jacqueline asked me a question. Hey, could you send me the Figueroa case law? Uh, I want to make sure my team uses it in our files, especially in construction claims, when we're raising labor market attachment. We often see that injured workers file jobs that indicate not hiring or job filled, yet the law judge still finds the injured worker attached. We can use this case law to argue against it. Yes, Jacqueline, you can, and I will send it to you after the uh, matter. So uh, that's absolutely uh, useful for us. Uh, I think that the idea of writing down on your attachment worksheet, not hiring, not hiring, not hiring, it's really like, well, are you really, is that even considered a job look? It's not, right? Uh, so now we've got good case law on that. I'll certainly send you the Figueroa case, no problemo. Uh, Anne asked the question, in the Horvath matter, did the court consider the policy language that states the insured must cooperate? Well, no. Let me tell you a little secret about the Workers' Compensation Board. Uh, they don't spend a heck of a lot of time reading policies. Um, and it's crazy to me, but yeah, I mean, the, the, that would be, I think, a great reason for the carrier to disclaim the case and say, hey, you hid this one under the rug in the back room, and then, you know, uh, uh, you know, you waited for your policy renewal to go by, and then you report this. I mean, there's clearly uh, a lack of cooperation, and I would say bordering on bad faith on the part of the insured there. Uh, but in this case, the case law on it actually is just based, uh, only looks at the notice issue. Uh, that was what was apparently raised by the carrier. That was the only issue that was raised was that the notice was prejudicial to them, and that's what the case was decided on. All right, uh, that's all my questions so far. If you have more questions and I'm not uh, answering it, please feel free. Uh, you can email me afterwards. You'll get a nice email after this from, from the service saying, hello, the thing just ended. Um, oh, and as a follow-up question, how often would the court accept a disclaimer of coverage under the facts? Extraordinarily rarely. And in fact, uh, where I've been successful on disclaiming, it's typically done uh, at the, the Supreme Court and you come back and say, look, I have got this order. And even at that point, sometimes the workers' compensation court will go, aha, that's cute, Greg. I don't recognize their jurisdiction. This is workers' compensation court. I'm going to award benefits and you guys can sue each other afterwards to get the money back. So, unfortunately, that's how the board typically looks at those types of uh, disclaimer disputes. All right, so that's questions. Let me close that. All right, I just want to remind everyone, uh, we're doing this every month. The first Monday of the month, our construction webinar. Second Monday, we're going to do our subrogation and risk transfer webinar. Third Monday, and that would have been yesterday, but it was a holiday, so we moved it to Tuesday, is this uh, New York Workers' Comp webinar. And then uh, New Jersey, we're always going to be here on the fourth Monday of the month. Next month, I'll be leading a discussion about the tactical use of appeals in New York workers' compensation cases uh, and when to use it and when not to. All right. Uh, I hope everyone had a great time. It's been a pleasure serving and working with you all in 2019. And I'm looking forward to working with you in 2020. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a great week.